it's so light in here. I'm so used to the trees readings having kind of pitch black behind us, so you'll have a lovely view uh, for the reading. And uh, welcome. Thank you so much for coming out on this extraordinarily cold, 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 soon to be even colder winter day. Uh, we're so happy to have you here um, for our excellent Trius reading series. Um, our uh, our fall resident Chris Bonnie is is back to welcome his friend uh, into town, and I'll let him do the introduction. But first, I want to remind you to turn your cell phones off uh, if they are currently on. Uh, and I also want to thank a few people, as I always do at the beginnings of these. Uh, these readings, I want to thank Peter Trius first and foremost, who established this this reading series and established the fall residency. Um, uh, so you're going to be registering relatively soon, and we'll have a brand new Trius writer in residence. It's going to be a poet. Uh, it will it will probably be a woman poet, uh, and we are uh, thrilled to to pieces to be able to offer you the Trius tutorial or the Trius uh, class workshop again, the fall workshop. So if you're a creative writer at all, even if you're not an English major, uh, consider uh, at looking to be in this class, submitting some material and having some creative stuff so that you can study with a, a world-class writer uh, like Chris Avani for a whole semester here at HWS. It's a really extraordinary opportunity. Um, I'm Catherine Coles, I'm the director of the Trius Residency. If you have any questions about that, come and uh, talk to me or send me an email or something and I can tell you more about that. Um, but Peter Trius established this uh, residency and this reading series in order to enable you to do this really, really cool thing. So you should take advantage of that. Um, uh, in addition to thanking Peter Tri Trius, I want to thank the English department. I want to thank the provost's office uh, and Africana Studies, all of whom have come together to make this reading series possible. And with no further ado, uh, I would like to introduce the introducer, Chris Abani. <laughs> Good evening, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's freezing outside, and and I was not going to come, but you know, <laughs> I have to. No. Um, so I wanted to introduce uh, Matthew Shinoda to you. Um, I'm, I'm lucky to meet strange people, beautiful people, in strange, uh, unusual circumstances. I met Matthew in um, in San Francisco when he used to teach at Berkeley. I was up there doing a Vona workshop and a, a poet friend of, of, of we share in common who introduced us to her Hamad and she wanted us all out to go to dinner so she had a ride and I didn't have a ride. And Matthew said, oh, I'll give you a ride. So I walked outside and uh, Matthew had a, a motorcycle <laughs> and he comes in his helmet and we get on this bike, two, two big African men on a motorcycle. And we did, we get into this heated conversation about Derek Walcott and, and Mrs. Zaire, and we're going on and on about it, and we pull up with these lights, and I remember looking, and there was, our, there was uh, this older couple, older white couple, in a convertible BMW, <laughs> and they took one look at us, and they seemed to be terrified, like they were about to reach out and lock the doors. And then, but then I said to Matthew, and, and she calls herself a lyric poet? And they just started laughing. Uh, and I realized at that moment that I had lost my black terrorizing privileges. Um, I, I, had, I, had, I had become so bougie, no one was going to be scared of me anymore. Um, but these are the strange ways uh, you, meet, you meet friends. Um, and essentially, from the, it became clear that Matthew and I grew up in the a, in a sort of same contemporary African notion of a pan-African identity. And pan African identities are fascinating things. In fact, the whole independence movement of in West Africa particularly, but I would even argue in North Africa, Matthew is, is Egyptian, is, uh, is that almost every kind of movement of independence, of self-declaration for Africans against uh, colonialism is actually created for us and brought to us through African studying abroad by particularly the Caribbean, so people like Marcus Garvey, but also the entire black civil rights movement. So essentially there is no independence movement in Africa without the African American civil rights movement. There is no African uh, without Marcus Garvey, without uh, Malcolm X. And, and also being raised in these ways uh, sort of has always convinced us that um, our aesthetics have to be wide enough to be about more than just being African. 
or being Egyptian or being Nigerian, that it has to be about a much more global identity that is rooted in a conversation that can transcend everything. And so I present to you my, um, my friend Matthew, who's a vital and engaged and political artistic mind. Um, so Matthew Shinoda occupies an interesting place. He's American, he's Egyptian, but an African, and, but everyone thinks of Egypt as being in the Middle East. And one of his pet peeves has always been introduced as a Middle Eastern writer. <laughs> so Matthew is one of a handful of not Middle Eastern poets <laughs> working, <laughs> working in America and quite possibly the sole important Egyptian voice in English. His work has its roots in the Coptic tradition, ancient Egyptian traditions, and also in the diaspora artistic engagements of Bob Marley and the lyricism of reggae, the work of Emmy Cesar, Derek Walcott, and yet speaks to a contemporary Egyptian moment and a contemporary American moment. His, book, his most recent book of poems, Diverse Suit, traces an, evo uh, an evolution of the moment that led to the Egyptian Revolution of 2012 and locates the search for self and personhood in an ever-evolving matrix of culture, art, and politics to chart a hope-filled, and one can argue, transcendent reality. To say that he's an important American poet is to understate his brilliance and his oeuvre. Shinoda lectures widely, has taught extensively in the fields of ethnic studies and creative writing, the former assistant provost for equity and diversity and faculty in the School of Critical Studies at Cal Arts. He's currently uh, you know, well, associate dean and now you're the chair of the uh, creative writing department uh, at Columbia College in Chicago. He is also a founding member of the African Poetry Book uh, Fund, of which I'm a member, and what we do is we set up a prize to publish African poets and bring them into kind of contemporary moments in, in, in America, and, and he's been really amazing at, at that. He, um, his debut collection of poets, Somewhere Else by Coffee House, was named one of 2005's debut books of the year by Poets and Writers, and was a winner of a 2006 American Book Award. He's also the author of Seasons of Lotus, Seasons of Bones, editor of Duppy Conqueror, and Selected Poems by Kwame Dawes, and most recently the author of the Tahir Suite of Poems, published by Troy Quarterly Books in Northwestern University. Matthew, as those of you who are in workshop with him today, speaks quietly. I can actually honestly say I've never seen Matthew raise his voice. And yet within this moment of quiet is a searing and rebellious engagement, uh, a political drive that refuses to be described, refuses to be circumscribed, but always for him is in the service of an art that is transcendent, an art that in itself exists first and primarily to help him locate his personhood, his humanity, and in the context hopes in a way to bring others into the conversation. Please welcome Matthew Shin. Good evening. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris, for that um, really not well-earned introduction from my part, but I'll take it. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you to the folks who are uh, running the Trius series for bringing me. I'm going to read from this uh, new collection, Tahrir Suite, and I'll say just a few words about it and then launch into it. This is a, a book-length poem, so it's just one long poem um, divided into a few sections, and this was basically a response for me as I was watching the events in Egypt beginning in 2011 and, and to the present really unfold and kind of trying to find a way to to think through these moments of change in, in the kind of post-post-colonial era or whatever era it is that we're presently living in. And the, the narrative here, um, loosely described, is of a man by the name of Tekla and a woman by the name of Isis who begin just outside of Cairo very early on in the book, and I'll, I'll start there at the beginning. Um, and they're, they're preparing to immigrate to the United States, and just as they're doing so, the revolution erupts, and then they get their papers to leave and kind of make the choice to, to move on with their own migration. And so they begin the process of immigration and assimilation and all of this while the country that they grew up in is going under this kind of incredible transformative change. And so in a lot of ways, this book is an exploration of the notions of diaspora and home. So we'll leave it at that and 
just begin launching into it here. And you'll just have to, there's no breaks really, so just sink into your chair and, and dig into this. It's an old tradition of long poetry. It begins with, uh, it's true. Oh, wow. Very long. It, it, it begins with uh, two epigraphs. The first from the great Mexican-American poet, Benjamin Adair Sanz, who writes, I don't live anywhere, not anymore. I am redefining home. Home is related to certainty. And the second epigraph from Bob Marley, the truth is an offense, but not a sin. The eruption. In the country of waiting, time is the essence that threads modernity to antiquity. Shortly after sunrise, Tekla descended a ladder made of fallen palms. Down from the roof of his sleep, he entered the courtyard aside a mud wall, eyes half shut to the saline air. He meditated on the sleek dust that cooled his feet, gazed east at the sun coming over Lake Arun. Isis could not make out the shadows. Probed by her own remembrance, she made solace from the warmth of her blankets, knew this day could not be like any other. They would reach the city in short order, partake of the migration that was to come. They would greet their crossing, but first an eruption. All who gather know you have to feel it to reveal it. Sudden in your own infancy, you realize the ground is something new. The protesters converging in a single place, made a home of something old, began the chants that transform night. If order can preserve us, will indicate desire in every motion, walk the same route on every morning, hum the same song on every evening. The skies of this earth a remnant, foretold before its own story, amorphous like squalor in the night, we are made to understand the cavernous heart. Isis reached and searched for reciprocity, dreamed had been attained before, committed to her memory, assured it was hers to find. Darkness, an outlet, light, a small shadow, when a walk of ire becomes what is known, a mask fractured by cold independence, Boldness is the sole remedy. This new language, strangely palatal, every word a rendition, unmistaken like the scent of sea permeating her skin. This is a crucial thing, that one cannot live without the threads of dignity, that one cannot live without acceptance, that one cannot live without a son to guide. Ekphrasis was her name. She was the child of an open song that carried its melody from disparate shores and buried its rhythm in the hot touch sand. The skylark trills into morning light, and they know this sound can bring them back. They know this call will follow them. Sparse, like a calling by its own accord, flush at the intersection of turquoise, birds dive into a fresh-cut horizon. Her throat swells with clouds of salt. Was this the way his ancestors lived? Memory entombed within, geography was never the exemption. Never in a straight line, Isis continued to wander into night, crossing from one field to the next, making her way to the outer edge. When the fruit of the tree falls to earth, something is there to meet it. Darkened by the shade above, it follows its own path downward. And she began to speak. To those who stand in opposition of altruism, God gave you agency that one day you may discover it. O son of the dance, like a rock shadow, you must learn to split this life in two holes, find meaning in every sip to quench your thirst as clouds tumble through the sky. Isis left the city square, hoping to disappear the buildings to her back. She walked into a new day. They told him how they'd make him new, gave him labor half the week, sang his praise before his face, but every smile excised his poise. 
There is a passion in the measured lines of her palms as she learns to work for second chances. A revifying melody bounces through her head. She finds the step to push on through. Illiteracy is silence, a night to bury the calligrapher's pen, a hidden chorus in the alley light. Sullen was her weight. As the world stood still, she fought herself to feel for something more, prayed the ash of resistance into coal, and painted her eyes to see. When her child first arrived, she understood the contrarian view. She buried shells in the sand, each with a name tucked inside. Tekla found his love in an open market. Fumes and fabrics tangled together, he felt an elastic vibration, knew his steps would forever change. She could not yet see the day, knew that something familiar stood before her. She borrowed a face from the woman next door and descended the steps. He was made angry by the wicked words of those who did not see the gathering, a bouquet of bodies standing demure, leaning into silent change. She thumbed the rough of a bottle cap and thought of drought, could not shake the image of blood pooling on sand, opened her eyes to the shimmering city. Isis knew this was the time. Armed with a voice and body, she raised her arms to the sky and swallowed her saliva. How do you disappear fear? Quelled by misremembering, shorn by time scissors, made hot by the starry night. There is more to this than a friendly mask. A dictator swallows the clouds for shade, and the people are left beneath the sun as fire rages in their spines. A breeze reminds us of redemption, the heat of bodies packed together in a steel cage, praying only for a small bit of wind. She watched as the bodies vanished in the crowd, capitulating to the heat as the men dragged them away, the white of their shirts her last sight of them, as blood dropped slowly from their faces. The Settling This was their sanctuary now. Tomorrow was never a promise. Tekla worked for his longing and stole glances at his own recollection, felt himself on a floating expanse balanced between land and air. Isis knew that as her child grew, her past would become an obscurity, a story told by a distant teller. She knew now the way that snow could make a place new, the way history could bury itself. They sat beside one another, smiled at thoughts of arrival, told the story of themselves. Anticipation, a new land, vast like an upward spire, the pain in her belly, a new inertia, and the yearning to forget. When you first arrive, your essence stolen, the past locked in memory, it is as if no other seed had been planted. If splendid were a tale you tell, you'd praise the past as if it hadn't pierced. You'd gather your neighbors and perjure all the night. And all who came before you, lackluster in their eyes, falter in their step. And you rise this way, greet the morning haze, blinded by a waning recollection, frightened by the possibilities of distance being your home. How they live too well, replete with sorrow, they fill the jugs of empty, drive the memory from their crowns. He wondered how tanks could rule a people, how men trained for killing can make a nation, how a nation can make men for killing. She watched from afar as her sister bled, how the color of her undergarment shaped the landscape, the sinister tread of black boots made for flesh, one calloused hand forcing another. If he were there now, would he stand and chant the dusk to light? Would he stay the night by his child's side, strung by wood for reverie, if he were there now? What can we call home? Will the heart suffice? Is scent enough to make our lives feel whole? Shall I keep the pot to cook ceaselessly? How does the soil make us firm? 
The square is our false door, our chance a prayer for all who disappeared. We must not be mired in the present and forget. To acknowledge victory, one must not succumb. If every thread we knot is untangled by dread, we can only learn to weave once more, stain our fingers with new dye. The youth are bold with tenacity, recumbent only to dream. They make a vow to trust and laughter to overshadow sway. <clears throat> Counting on her slender fingers, the number who have called her names have taken claim to what cannot be owned, her voice a strident anthem. We will know to be unified by vigor. None of us shall be left by the wayside. No place for women is no place for men. This struggle or no struggle. Let the people decide. Let the Sphinx be our witness. Let the day be new like the Song of Solomon that our hearts may abide. In every elevated hand, the lines for tomorrow pleading with open palms that their life can match their spirit, that their stretch might reach the sky. The sin is to come with your own to march the streets with a predetermined strut, to shake the rock before you know its quarry. Only a bird can trace the sky. If we can make this plight our daily, can fill the gulf with laughter, our meditation could make for a nation. How long can we hold? Power must succumb. To irrigate, we need the water wheel. Abundant our crops, bountiful our glory, vital is this life we make. There is a difficulty on these mild streets, to roam in a place without an antecedent, untethered, an illusion of freedom. I have made my peace, he says to himself. I have found the note that makes my voice call. I have swallowed emptiness to be full. I have seen color everywhere. What this life can become is what this life will be worth. There will be no standard in the spine of a man, no guide in the face of a woman. A man must shout from the hollow of his body. A man must learn to stretch in an open field. A man must, must learn to strum his wish. A man must learn simply to speak. Oh, how I feel all right. She takes the sun from on high, calls it by its old name, calls the strength of her own ribs. If I can learn to make a place, I will bellow from the balls of my feet, brush each child's hair for strength. I'm to put it on, wear each joy like stone. Lord, the coming is in the returning. We will take to the skies with our wings, wherever we land is home. Give me this strength. No man shall make me his own. I call upon each descendant. The foolish zealots have forgotten, could not find the road that leads to a fork, cannot make a way for solemn ties. They've been cursed by the god of inundation. He could not fathom what had become. Where was the magnitude of his youth? And who were these men of foreign promise, these songless spirits cursing his land? Oh, how she burned for exuberance, to learn to dance in her children's feet, to blanket the square with linen and watch the people drift. He will chant a song, give thanks O most high. Why should I masquerade and bury my roots? It's no matter if men don't like my faith, my voice is my only spear. Isis could not help but smile, the way the young could carry on, the way their cynicism could make the sun rise. Theirs was a glorious resolution, remarkable in their narrowness. Why must the nation share one symbol, like the papyrus of the north and the lotus of the south? Plurality has its place. If this could make a life feel fresh, she was willing to stumble, to make fire from the ashes of disaster, to become a falcon paddling the air. He remembered the way his father used to speak, assured of a trajectory that led to this moment, unquestioning of intercession, trusting in the hands of others. She watched the Bougainvillea climb, ornament of her youth, 
coloring memory, how one plant could survive in divergent places. She plucked it for her hair and wore it as an emblem. I'll take the same path. I'll plant the same trees. I'll learn to live in visibility. I'll honor the bones and ask them for guidance. I'll make familiar this habit. Make my offenses a quiet yearning. Turn my thoughtless heart to succor. Make my hands a respite of hope and let me call nowhere my home. How can a man call his home a nation if his own heart is disunited? If he wanders from his children's wants, cannot hear the open notes for their thirst. Memory is the residence of truth. Sheltering scars from the wind, she shapes the clay with her fingertips, places each thought in the lip of a bowl. His heart had learned to saunter, move between the border of its cavity, find the liminal brush sprouting from the red earth, each step a register of earth and sky. My children will learn to call. They will learn the words for freedom. They will learn to walk with splintered feet. She dreamt of the square, children in her arms, feet rooted to the pavement of her past. She watched as all their memories transformed, hummed a song of remembrance. Thank you. question in my own head and that it has no answer to it and it's I think the, the poetic form needed to kind of pick up that cyclical nature so that the division of poems that would traditionally happen in a book weren't really going to work so what I what I initially did is I wrote the entire book in a form that I had created based on several pieces of music and they were, it was a 10 stanza form that repeated itself throughout the entire book. So I'd written the whole book this way and then realized that I was really sick of the form and actually didn't like it. And so I, I basically, oh, sorry, I basically scrapped a huge chunk of the book and began to rewrite it. So there are still elements of that form in there. There, there are certain elements of the musicality in there, but I felt like it was too constricting that it needed to breathe in a way. So I broke it from the form and kind of rewrote the book to create this long poem, and I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, um, and I, I think in terms of the lyric, I think it still very much engages the lyric tradition, um, but in a slightly non-linear way, I suppose. But you conceived it as two main characters at the start, I mean, so you had, you know, you had persons in the Right. Well, I think, I mean, I mean, when you look at the book, the form of it oscillates and the voices shift in this way. And I, I thought it was really important to encompass this, not in a really stringent narrative, but to have real human beings in this, because that was my interest in the story. Right? I wasn't interested in writing a kind of polemical or political piece about the uprising in Egypt. Um, you know, there's been plenty of that done, and all of it is completely wrong at this point. But I, I think what I wanted to do was to tell a human story. And the only way that I could do that, I think, in a way that implicated myself and was honest for me as a writer, was to do it through an immigration narrative, through a diaspora narrative, because that is my own experience. I was actually in Tahrir Square like four days before the revolution began, just kind of standing there with my daughter, who was 11 months old at the time, hanging out, and a few days later, the whole world changed, right? And so and at that point, we had just come, we had arrived home a few days, a couple days before, back to the United States. And so this was a very jarring moment, right? To watch all of this stuff unfold, and my family there, and then 
you know, not just what was happening politically, but even in a, in a very personal way, not just my relationship to my family and the country, but the fact that I'd literally just been standing there like days earlier, and it was very calm, and you know, we were just kind of hanging out. And so I, I started to think about how I could tell the story in a way that made sense to me, I guess. So you mentioned home. You said, <clears throat> I had just come home. So what, what is home for you in this case? What does that mean? Yeah, that's a trick question. <laughs> um, it's a good question. Home, home at this point in my life, I think home is wherever my family is. I, I think we've moved around enough and have kind of done the diaspora circuit enough that it doesn't really matter as long as certain people are there that becomes home. I mean, I know that sounds really kind of cheesy and cliche, but it's true um, in the sense that Nowhere is home. I mean, this is why I start with that, that Benjamin Alersan's, you know, epigraph, which I think is so beautiful, that, that he argues that home becomes the sense of certainty, and if there's anything I'm certain of, it's that I'm not certain. Okay. Um, and so home then becomes where we're living. And, and I think that it's very fluid for me, which is both very freeing and very constricting at the same time. You know, I've spent an, an, a pretty significant amount of time in Egypt, and I have a great deal of family there, so it is certainly one of many homes. But at this point, wherever, you know, my family, my, my immediate family is, becomes home. Which is a way to completely dodge your question, because I have absolutely no answer to it. <laughs> but in a way, I think, I mean, I, I do think one important piece of this is that that's part of the exploration of this book is to try and figure out what this notion of home means. And it's an exploration that I don't ever intend to come up with a definitive answer for, right? but just a way to kind of, I suppose, in a sense, comfort ourselves. I think that this is the struggle of all people in diaspora, that you know, at, at a certain point, the schism becomes great enough that you're neither here nor there. So you live, as I often say, if there is any true home geographically, it's probably somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. Because that's kind of how we live. We just live stretched between these spaces. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I will settle on one. Um, which is that at the beginning you said that this, that this uh, book moved to the present. Which obviously, I know that can't um, actually be true because you moved. Right. know everything that would happen when you wrote the book. Um, but I wonder, how are you thinking about the Egyptian present and how it links to the work? Um, That's a really great question. This was something I struggled with, and I think it's the reason that this book took on a very odd form in a way, um, and, and this kind of more quote-unquote experimental engagement with this, uh, because I knew that anything I attempted to do that was definitive would be rendered useless before I had finished, you know, putting my pen to paper. And so this is another reason why I wanted to locate this in the narrative of two human beings. Um, in terms of the present moment, in certain ways, I trust somebody asked me this question earlier, in certain ways I almost try not to think much about it because I'm, I'm just kind of sick of it at this point, frankly. Um, because the situation in Egypt is so contradictory and tumultuous and confusing that I, 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 I think the only true and honest answer is I have no idea. I don't think anyone has any idea what's going to happen there. It's just kind of floating in this very strange space. And I, I talk to people there all the time and nobody really knows, you know, people on the ground. They have no idea what's going on. It's all kind of up in the air, and people are waiting in a really interesting way that I'm kind of fascinated by, right? Because we have this incredible moment of activism, and, and there are certainly still elements of that happening, but it's now moved into this really interesting space of waiting, which I find both a natural conclusion of things and a really problematic way 
to engage, right? You know, Miri Baraka once said that, you know, the problem with their movement, of the black arts movement, especially early on in the 60s, is that they, they initially defined revolution as an event and then came to realize that revolution is not an event, revolution is a process. Um, so Egypt is in the middle of that process, but I think many people engaged it as an event and thought, once we accomplish the toppling of this dictator, the event is over and a new narrative begins. But of course, humans are far messier than that, so that's not at all what happened. And so I think a lot of people are actually taken back. And I imagine there's very interesting, quiet work happening right now that will, in the future, become very important in beginning to articulate that narrative. That's an awesome answer. Thank you. So how do you access the human narratives that you're trying to produce from afar? Is it difficult to put yourself in place as someone that's on the ground in Egypt under CC? Um, or, if, or do you go there yourself? I, I haven't been back since 2011, but I usually go back regularly, and I, I haven't been able to just because life has been life, but I don't know that I find a particular difficulty with that because it's a very intimate space to me. Um, you know, my father was the eldest of eight children, and he's the only one who ever left the country, so all of his siblings and their children and their children's children are there. A bunch of my mother's family is still there, so it's a... It's a very familial space, so I can, I mean, I, I talk to people a lot, I pay attention to the news, all of this kind of thing, and, and the space, I've spent enough time there that it's an extremely familiar place, so accessing that is not particularly difficult. I think especially as a writer, where we often invent spaces that are completely foreign to us and kind of make it up. Um, so that, that piece of it, I don't think has been a great, struggle. It's just figuring out how to tell, and again, this is why the immigration narrative of this became so important for me, because I didn't want to tell the story of someone on the ground, right, because I'm not on the ground. And, and they would tell a very different story, right? The other piece, I also have very different political views as a result of my own, you know, intellectual trajectory and growth and living in diaspora and so on, I, we, it, 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 it would feel very inauthentic to me, which is a very loaded term, but it would, it would feel problematic for me to kind of tell it in that way. And so it became important to, to talk about this from a distance, so the narrative quite literally does that. Um, at the workshop earlier, you were talking about uh, reggae aesthetic as something kind of combining the political and the sensual and the um, personal with, with, with larger political stuff and the spiritual. Um, and I was wondering if you consider this book in particular, uh, as, maybe even as opposed to your other two books, to be in the reggae aesthetic. And so how, how does it fit? Yes, I would consider it within the reggae aesthetic. So what Catherine said is that I was talking earlier about the reggae aesthetic having three basic principles of the political, the social, the, the spiritual, and the sensual. Um, and I think all of those elements are incredibly layered. I mean, the political piece is quite obvious in this book. Um, but I think the sensual piece, the book engages the relationship of these two and their children, and they have a child somewhere within this narrative. And it's not a kind of straight ahead narrative, but it's all buried in there. So that, that piece, I think, exists. And the spiritual is all over this book. I mean, part of it is, and, and this is an important piece of the narrative, so thank you for bringing this up, right? The, the characters, Tekla and Isis, have very specific names. And their names are both rooted in the Coptic community, which is the community that I come from. So anyone who Though I didn't want this to become a salient and overarching part of the book, anyone who is familiar with the kind of internal politics of Egypt can see this in the book, that these two characters are also struggling with a kind of spiritual praxis and what is happening in the country between these various religious factions. Um, and, and that was very important, again, for me to tell because that's part of my own narrative. Right? I mean, the Coptic community, for example, when you know, in the first election that happened when Mohamed Morsi was um, elected president, were terrified 
I mean, he's a member of, of you know, a relatively extremist organization, depending on how one, you know, views things historically within the country. And, and this, for many, signaled a real problem. I mean, one of the major issues that the Coptic community had with the Mubarak regime was the kind of legal segregation of the community that, you know, in, in ensconced in Egyptian law were very specific laws against the Coptic community engaging in various forms of power. And, and this is still the case. I mean, the, the Egyptian constitution does not allow a cop to be president of the country, right? So that there are all of these kinds of religious edicts embedded in the constitution. And so part of the Coptic community's impetus for this revolution, which was also a very beautiful moment in not engaging in a sectarian division, which was a very rare moment. I mean, Egypt has historically been a very divided country on religious terms. Egypt is an extremely religious country, and I mean this in, in a very literal sense, right? From ancient Egyptian times to the present, the core of Egyptian life is a spiritual core. And so the advent of Islam coming into Egypt in you know, the, the seventh century, this shift of that dynamic and created a really interesting binary. Um, so in that sense, I think it was important to locate those two individuals in that narrative. And I think there, all this to say, I think there's a very strong spiritual component in the book. There are many references throughout the book that again, if you're familiar with traditions in the Coptic church, certain kinds of rituals, they're embedded in there. Um, as well as, as pushing back and questions about other dominant religious paradigms. So, yes, I think it fits the way aesthetic. I hope, anyways. I want to ask you, you brought up this, so the, the notion of there, right? And, and the political act. So, so here, <clears throat> the Coptic Church in Egypt and the Coptic Church in Ethiopia, some of the, it's actually the oldest Christianity that probably exists in the world. And so much of like the Coptic, Things in the Coptic Church come out of ancient Egyptian religion. And so I'm asking, like, when you name the Knights, when you name the Knights, when you do this kind of work, is this like an intentional political act where you're trying to link uh, the Coptic identity to the ancient, to the ancient Egypt, and then that's sort of where you talk about Islam as a foreigner and that kind of way. And then it brings up, you have this beautiful essay on water, where you, where you talk about the Sad Dam basically obliterating an entire Coptic community that lives now as ghosts under all the walls. So I'm just curious about how you think history and religion as an intentional political thing. This is the type of this. Yeah, that's a big, big question. But yes, I think it's, it's very much there in the sense that, well, there's a very interesting division in Egypt about identity. I mean, as even in your introduction to me, there's a lot of debate amongst Egyptians as to who we are. I mean, we're a very mixed culture in this way. Um, for the Coptic community, the, the advent of Christianity was part of a natural progression, at least the, the story we tell ourselves, um, of ancient Egyptian religious practice. And, and you see this evolution even linguistically with the Coptic language being rooted, you know, first in Demotif, one of the hieroglyphic languages, and then moving towards, you know, incorporating ancient Greek lettering and so on, and that influence was there and so on. And so there's always been a very direct link. Um, and as you say, in the Coptic church, many of the saints have Coptic spins on ancient Egyptian gods' names, right? And, and again, you had mentioned this in the workshop earlier, that ancient Egyptian religious practice was a monotheistic practice. And so the Egyptians saw this as a natural evolution. So the Coptic community, very much sees itself in that trajectory. Some elements, and I don't want to speak for people, so this gets complicated, but some elements of the Muslim community in Egypt certainly accept that as part of the history and others do not. And this becomes a really interesting kind of combative way of understanding one's identity, right? In the sense that the majority of Muslims in Egypt Right, were once actually Copts and converted for various reasons into Islam, the Nubian community being the most obvious because they actually were practitioners of the Coptic tradition 
and the Coptic religion much longer than the mainstream community, and then had a kind of mass conversion around the 1500s over into Islam, right? Whereas the majority of the country had converted much, much earlier in history than that. And so many recognize that history and say, you know, we're all Egyptians who've taken on these different religious practices. But then there's an influence coming out of the Gulf states, which really has a very long and complicated history. But this has really built up immensely starting in the 1980s in particular, where a lot of Egyptians were going over to Saudi Arabia and other areas in the Gulf for work and coming back with the Salafist tradition of Islam, which is a very dogmatic tradition. And in that tradition, linking oneself to the Prophet Muhammad makes you closer, in a sense, to God. And so this, this has always existed in this narrative, but it has become even more so a kind of declaration of Arabness and a rejection of Egyptianness, because that declaration of Arabness connects one through the lineage to the Prophet Muhammad, which biologically, in terms of actual genealogy, is probably utterly untrue for the overwhelming majority of Egyptians. But this becomes a new story to make that link and shift identity. Right? So this, this is a very, you know, the, the Coptic community always incorporated ancient Egypt, not always in a positive way, but it was there. So if you go to fourth and fifth century monasteries out in the eastern desert of Egypt, and you actually pause for a moment and take a look as you're walking up steps, for example, if you turn your head, you'll often know that the side of the steps have hieroglyphs on them. Right? So these are old temples where they took the building blocks of the temples and built them into churches. So you actually, in a very physical, architectural way, see this engagement. You will go to you know, certain temples in Aswan and you'll see Coptic crosses carved amongst the hieroglyphs in those temples, right? And those were from monks who had lived in those temples in the fourth and fifth century, right? And so there, there's an interesting kind of constant interplay with ancient Egypt and the Coptic community. The Muslim community, that is much less obvious. I mean, it's, it's there because we're all Egyptians, but the declaration of it is much less of something that, that people kind of are open about. I think Copts, in a sense, are very proud of this history. You know, you'll hear this very often. We are the descendants of ancient Egyptians, which of course just is a way to say we're the greatest people on the planet. We've <laughs> basically invented everything and you know the whole world is subservient to us, even though they can't figure out how to get enough petrol for the gas stations in our country. <laughs> Other questions? Students? Are there any students here? <laughs> So this is an interesting question. I think this actually, this might have something to do with one's identity. I don't know. I, I, I feel like I've been very fortunate as a young writer growing up in this country. I was embraced by a bunch of different and very interesting traditions. A lot of the older writers of various ethnic movements of the 1960s, people coming out of the American Indian Movement, the Black Arts Movement, the Chicano Renaissance, were mentors to me at various points. So my work has always been embraced by marginal writers, but not from my own community. And this has been a really interesting influence of me. And I, I learned this very early on, that you know the, the stuff I was learning in school, although some of it was very interesting, was not relating to me. It wasn't giving me a kind of aesthetic and, and sense of craft in the work that I wanted to do. And so I, I turned to many of those writers and then just by good fortune, I suppose, had the ability to build relationships with folks like Amiri Barak and Quincy Proof or Sonia Sanchez from the Black Arts Movement, Simon Ortiz, who was a very central you know, poet in the American Indian Renaissance, Juan Felipe Herrera, one of your former colleagues, was major in the kind of Chicano Renaissance. And so a lot of them really embraced me as a very young writer. They were incredibly supportive of me. And so I, I, I definitely see myself within that lineage in a way. 
but then I think there's a theoretical lineage too. You know, you had mentioned Cesar, who's been a huge influence of mine, um, and a lot of the kind of theoreticians out of the Caribbean and the Pan-Africanist movements have been huge influences in my thinking and in my poetry. And you know, Cesar, Edouard Lissant from Martinique, you know. Moved on Wish, a lot of these, you know, not use Palestinian, but a lot of these kind of major thinkers who were engaging both theory and poetics at the same time became, I think, big influences for me. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.